to introduce our next speaker, Sushue Chen uh, from the University of Florida. So just a little bit about him. He took his PhD, so make sure I get this right, Shanghai Institute for Plant Physiology. Yeah. Uh, and then he came, or he went to, he was a Humboldt, Humboldt Fellow in Germany. And then he uh, came, I'm, I'm sort of highlighting here, he came to the, to the US and the Danforth Center in Missouri, where you were, what was your role at Danforth? Proteomics core director. Proteomics core director at the Danforth. It's a lovely institute. If you've ever been to St. Louis, you should check it out. And then uh, in 2006, he started uh, a faculty position at the University of Florida, the Department of Biology. Uh, I know F Florida very well. And, and turns out, uh, so I did my PhD at Florida, and um, Sushue's uh, uh, lab is located on a road that I used to bike by every day. Um, so that's really cool. I love to come back and check it out. So hopefully I get a chance to. Um, uh, but he's a, a, a researcher that applies uh, mass spectrometry techniques to plant biology and interested in the study of uh, plant signaling, plants interaction with their environment. And uh, um, he's got many awards, but uh, one I was most impressed with is your name professorship is after, it's called uh, uh, Colonel, last name Helm, is it? Colonel? Uh, I actually forgot. It's oh, so yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> well, he's the Colonel <laughs> so-and-so yeah, professor sure. of biology, which is pretty cool. <laughs> I'd love to be a Colonel one day. Um, <laughs> Sushwe, it's all yours. Welcome. Thank you very much. Um, it's, it's a great pleasure to come here. Can you guys hear me OK at the back? So you all refresh yourself, right? We're not supposed to use past tense. <laughs> so today I'm going to talk about um, a redox proteomics of gas cell immunity and the metabolomics of a gas cell carbon dioxide response. Uh, before I start, um, I want to thank uh, Josh and his colleagues and students for organizing such a one for um, summer school. I really enjoy it. And also for the event yesterday, it was wonderful, beautiful, uh, this sunset. Um, so this is, a, I learned, this is the largest uh, state park in Wisconsin, really. I know it's a lot of work, so <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you, guys. So I learned a lot from the workshop, and we all remember this uh, golden circle, right? So I will tell you why stomata immunity, why carbon dioxide response, and how we do that. We use uh, <laughs> redox proteomics, look at the uh, redox modifications uh, in response to um, uh, pathogen and uh, pathogen uh, associated molecular patterns. In this case, we use a flagellin uh, peptide, N-terminal 22 amino acid peptide. And we also use metabolomics to look at um, uh, signaling molecules, metabolites uh, in gas cell carbon dioxide response. I'll tell you how they are related. And in the end, what? Uh, um, what we have learned and what we can contribute to the society, to our community. And in my lab, we use Arabidopsis. We also use canola. So this is Brassicales, uh, amazing uh, plants to work with. So as you probably know, and Florida is pretty big um, uh, in citrus industry, but the citrus greening is a big problem. In four or five years, we're not going to have oranges from Florida, which is terrible. No juice anymore. It's bacterial disease. And this, these are not citrus, as you can see. These are tomatoes. Uh, tomatoes, Florida is the number one state uh, growing really delicious, tasty tomatoes. We're the number one state. California is also number one state. Uh, but their tomatoes are not so tasty, right, Steve? <laughs> 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 so made in Florida. It's all ketchup, I think, uh, canned food. Uh, uh, you will find, um, but Steve loves uh, Florida tomatoes. But tomato has a big problem, there's a bacterial disease. You know, uh, Florida is very humid. Um, uh, so when they have this disease, of course, um, the economic value uh, is lost. So bacterial disease account for 14% 14, 14 of the agricultural loss. Um, uh, that's pretty significant. And unlike 
Fungal pathogens, bacterial pathogens, have to enter plants through pores or wounding sites. Um, so on leaf surface, as many of you know, there are stomata pores. And a stomata are formed by these pairs of gas cells. And these cells are very, very interesting. They are sensitive to a lot of different environment factors. Not only just pathogens, they are sensitive to carbon dioxide, to light, to drought, uh, to different hormones. And um, in old days, people always think, you know, bacteria just go in through this opening, right? Plants don't do anything. Uh, that's what people believe until 2006. Sheng Yanghe actually published a cell paper showing that's not the case. So stomata gas cells have active defense mechanisms. In the past decades, people have made a lot of advances in understanding the stomata immunity. And one way is um, abscisic acid pathway, and another one is um, this uh, um, uh, flagellin, um, uh, the uh, PAM pathogen-associated molecular patterns uh, through this receptor FRS2. I'm not going. I'm not going to go into details of all this, but I just want to highlight: does it matter ABA pathway or this um, um, PAM pathway? Uh, you always have a lot of redox changes in, inside the cells, RS production. And our goal is to understand what are the proteins that are regulated by these redox changes. And um, so we use the proteomics, and I think uh, Andy and Jian Kang, they also uh, uh, found um, this uh, OST1, which is here, open stomata 1, um, is subjected to natural selection. And in my lab, we found more uh, redox regulations on this protein, and also some mycokinases. So our goal essentially use proteomics, use redox proteomics technologies to discover uh, novel redox regulated proteins. So how about carbon dioxide? So if you work with pathogens, you probably know uh, disease triangle. So you have bacteria, you have plants, then you have these environment factors. As you know, carbon dioxide in the air keep going up ever since the industry, industri industrial revolution. And you can see when you have high carbon dioxide, this is a Pseudomonas syringae, um, a DC3000. You can see the bacteria growth inside a cell becomes a lot higher, right? So when you knock out, ABA, when you don't have ABA, they uh, don't have this um, uh, susceptibility anymore. So if you measure ABA amount, um, as you can see, when you, have more and when you have a high carbon dioxide, you actually have more ABA produced. So it's very interesting, these hormone crosstalks. So it seems the ABA may affect, um, may mini mediate this carbon dioxide uh, effect. And as I mentioned, uh, the PAM response, you have RS production. When you have hot carbon dioxide, you also have RS production. So um, in our lab, we're interested in looking at redox responsive proteins, especially the cysteine um, uh, modifications. So I'm going to show you uh, our work first using redox proteomics tools to discover um, redox sensitive proteins. So first of all, we need to prepare really good stomata gas cells. Uh, one way of doing it is to blend the leaves in blender and to get rid of missile cells, then you have epidermal pavement cells and gas cells. So then we do very quick 10 minutes enzymatic digestion to break the pavement cells, then we get gas cells on, on the uh, matrix. Um, so you can see this is a neutral rest staining, this is a before digestion. You have uh, epidermal pavement cells, you have gas cells. After enzymatic digestion, the 10 minutes digestion, you only have stomata on, the, on this. So you don't have intact um, epidermal cells anymore. Uh, to look at the um, viability of these cells using the um, fluorescent uh, diacetyl assay, you can see these cells are viable. Then the question is, are they still responsive to carbon dioxide or to pathogen or to FLAG22? So this is a comparison between the epidermal cells and the isolated stomata. 
Uh, these two are controls. Uh, we we do use water to do the treatment, and these are using flag 22, the flagellin um, peptide. So as you can see, this is this is the pills and this stomata. So st the stomata prep we have are, are, are still responsive uh, to to this um, flag 22 treatment. This is stomata aperture. So stomata will close uh, within a couple hours. So this is our RS production to show you. We also measure the redox um, state inside cells. So you can see 15 minutes, there are pretty big uh, RS burst. So based on this, we actually choose like uh, these uh, six different time points to quantify, to do qu a quantitative uh, redox proteomics. As you learned uh, yesterday morning from uh, Dr. Lin Jun Li, uh, this uh, eye track technology, so I don't need to spend time on this. This is great. So I hope you all understand this multiplex, beautiful technology. Um, so, but we don't use uh, all eight of them. We just use six. Um, you will see in the next slides why. And I, I think it's very important whenever you look at a PTM, you also monitor the total protein level changes because the protein synthesis and protein degradation during this two hour period can really complicate your data analysis if you don't do this. Just like when you do kinase IC, you wanna show oh, E. coli or you wanna know the protein level changes. So we use iTrack essentially to monitor, to monitor the protein level changes. And how do we look at CC modifications? Luckily, we have a CIS-TMT and now they call it IODO-TMT. The technology is very similar except this uh, functional group. So it specific label cysteines. So, and the text is different from iTrack. You know, iTrack is from 113 to 121, and here is from 126 to 131. Really nice. And how do we do it? So this is a simplified diagram just to show you under control conditions, these cysteines are reduced. And when you have a ba bacteria or flag 22, these two responded and they become oxidized in this case, disulfide bond. So what we do during protein extraction, we actually put in iodocetamide to accolate the free thiols just in case, just to prevent artificial oxidation. Uh, so these will be all accolated and uh, so does this one, but disulfide bond is still there. Then you do a reduction this uh, reaction is not reversible, but this dicypher bond will break. So if you label this control with uh, 126, this 127, when you run the MSMS, remember we quantify at uh, MSMS level, you would expect to see 127 to be higher than this, right? So this reflect the oxidation of the cysteines. So in the beginning, we actually did the eye track, we do CIS-TMT separately, and it takes a lot of effort to pre prepare materials. And the most difficult part for us is when you have um, uh, significant redox changes, you don't have attract protein identified or you know, co correlation between the two experiments is pretty poor. So the, big, the, the nice thing about working with students is um, they are, there are a lot of good ideas. And this is actually the idea from my student. So uh, Jennifer Parker, sh she said, why should we do two experiments? Can, can we try this? So essentially what we did, so this is a little bit more complicated diagram where you have a structured disulfide bond. So this is control, this is a treatment. We still, during sample extraction, we block the free uh, cysteine uh, files. And then we do a reduction. And this is all at a protein level, and we label with the six TMPs. We can label with six tags because you know that's the uh, what is available with Josh's new code. We can probably do a lot more. And then we do a trypsin digestion. We cut into peptides. Um, the N-terminus will be exposed. Then you label the samples with a different R track. So now when you run the MSMS. So at uh, the low MOZ region, you can see, okay, in this case, my protein didn't change, but cysteines are oxidized. And you also know the site. So using this technology, we first did a proof of concept study 
Uh, we got six 16 rich proteins and we completely oxidize them, completely reduce them, then we mix, mix them at different ratios. So these red lines indicate the theoretical ratios where it should be. And then we, during this mixing, we keep the protein amount consistent. So then we run these samples on our um, RB trap, and this is an example of cysteine containing peptides. So here you would have the cystmt labeling, and here you would have iTrack labeling. As you can see, if you zoom in here, doesn't matter if you look at iTrack signal or you look at cystmt signal, they all follow the same trend. So for cysteine containing peptides, you can use either uh, for the quantification. So you can see the, this is the experimental values. Um, they, they look really good uh, compared to our expect, expectation. So this is a ratio between um, um, oxidized and reduced, as you can see the trend. So how about the total protein level? As I mentioned, we didn't change the total protein level. And it turned out, if you look at a non cysteine peptides, right, so you only see the iTrack labels, and you can see they're pretty much as expected. So now we have a stomata gas cell uh, preps and we have this technology. So we apply this technology and during this very short period of time, we identified more than 2,000 proteins in gas cells, but they are protein level changes. So although, although it's just a couple hours. So they are about um, uh, 80 protein significantly changed. And also, if you look at uh, 16, uh, CCTMT um, uh, label, uh, cysteine peptides, we identified about 700, but we have about 57 showed the significant changes. So what are they? So if you look at uh, the 15 minutes and the 30 minutes, these are just examples, we're pretty happy to see uh, known redox proteins like thiol peroxidase, right, uh, superoxide uh, dismutase, and uh, also some disease resistant proteins, right? Um, so there are also some other interesting proteins we pick for functional analysis, uh, but in this case, my student look at this lipid transfer protein. So this cysteine um, was oxidized. We only did MS2, so you may say the, the full change uh, is not really, really high. And um, you can see 30 minutes again, we see this lipid transfer protein, and we see it at different cysteines. So you can see um, uh, relatively uh, large changes. And at a protein level, which attracts signal, there are no significant changes. So one of the students uh, picked this protein and asked a very simple question. Is this lipid transfer protein really relevant to what we are, what we are interested in? Um, so a lot of times when you do omics, you know, you discover a lot of things. Many of them may not be directly related to the uh, biology processes you are interested in. So a very simple question, is LTP2 relevant to stomata immunity? So working with our Arabidopsis is very nice. It's model organism. You can get a lot of mutants as you want. So we got a homologous mutants of this. A lipid transfer protein two, and we infect with uh, Pseudomonas uh, DC3000. And as you can see, this is a bacterial growth, and you can see uh, this mutant is susceptible uh, to, uh, to the pathogen. So she was so excited uh, because this is the first indication it's important. It may be play an important role. And what we all expect, right? So you have more bacteria going in, so stomata must be really big big pores. So she actually tested the stomata in this mutant. So this is a Y type, this is a mutant. This is a zero uh, minute. So you can see at a zero minute without any treatment, the stomata is already smaller than the Y type. And after treatment with the FLAG22, it can close, um, but it's smaller to begin with. So the uh, aperture is much smaller, it, it can close much more than white type. So after we see this result, everybody was so disappointed, right? It's not what we expect. What's going on, right? This is a surprise. Smaller stomata, more susceptible 
It doesn't make sense. Right? Then we look at the protein uh, structure, we find out this protein, lipid transfer protein, is heavily cysteine rich. It's really cysteine rich. It has a lot of cysteines. So um, usually when you have uh, um, internal oxidative stress, your smaller pores tends to be smaller. So we tested ROS production. So it doesn't matter if you have treatment or not, mutant has more ROS. And we look at the uh, uh, free thiols. So mutant has a lower free thiols. Um, doesn't matter when you do treatment or not. When you do treatment, they have even lower free thiols. Uh, we also did some other experiment. If you add catalase uh, to this mutant, uh, to the gas cell prep, uh, the aperture actually goes up, uh, increase and uh, to the Y type level. Um, so this is a very interesting. We also did some work to check the uh, um, ABO, you know, the um, um, NADPH oxidase. Um, there are no change there. So what our working model is, um, when you have pathogen, when you do the treatment, or when you have mutation of this lipid transfer protein, um, so you tend to have more RS. So this lipid transfer protein somehow may function as a scavenger. And when you have a lot of RS, you might have membrane damage. We do have the uh, lipid oxidation data to show that there's some membrane damage there. Um, but the lipid transfer protein, um, based on that notation, is supposed to transfer lipid to uh, uh, do the repair process. So essentially, when you have a mutant, you don't have the uh, scavenger, you have more oxidative stress, then you have membrane damage, but then this lipid transfer protein cannot function, so it cannot do the repair. So this is our current mo working model, and we're still working on testing this model. Just a quick summary. I hope um, um, you guys are impressed how redox proteomics technologies can help us identify these novel um, um, redox sensitive proteins and through functional characterizations, through reverse genetics, um, you can validate uh, whether these uh, um, new redox regulated proteins are involved in the process or not. And it may function as a RS scavenger, also transfer the lipids for the membrane repair. Uh, we also found uh, kinases in, um, in our redox proteomics work, and because of time, I'm not going to talk about that. So now I'm going to switch gears a little bit. As I showed you in the introduction, when you have high carbon dioxide, plants um, tend to have um, more become more susceptible to pathogens. Uh, but we also know when you have high carbon dioxide, the stomata aperture tend to be small. Plants will close their stomata. So in this case, smaller uh, stomata aperture um, uh, actually also more susceptible to disease kind of correlate to our LTP mutant. So we also do the proteomics, but I just want to show you how we do metabolomics. And um, this is showing you when you have high carbon dioxide. So this is a, um, a AB, ambient 400 ppm here. So stomach aperture is pretty stable within one hour. But if you treat it with 800 ppm, you can see uh, within uh, 10 minutes, you see, you see significant, significant stomata closure. Okay. So we're, we're just working within this one hour period. So and in this process, as I showed you the image in the beginning, that you have RS production. You, you also have redox changes in the gas cells. So I don't need to introduce um, much about metabolomics. You know, Dr. Oliver Finn did such an excellent job. Um, but I just want to highlight, we use three different platforms. And our most success actually is with this targeted analysis. I actually purchased about 500 metabolites, Arabidopsis metabolites, and I set up all the MRM transitions, and uh, uh, we were able to uh, quantify about more than 300 metabolites in gas cells. 
Uh, GCMS, you really don't get mar much, mostly cent uh, central metabolites. And untargeted uh, UHPRC QTOF, uh, we do have a lot of features, um, but we don't have big success he here. We only have about a couple hundred metabolites from, uh, from there. Uh, so this is showing you what we get from these different uh, platforms. You can see they are highly complementary. And we have about 400 metabolites in the gut cells. And they cover many different pathways in this uh, CAC pathway map. So the red dot um, indicate you know, the pathways we have. We don't have a lot here, a lot here. So it's hard to get completely coverage. And uh, this is just showing you um, uh, the different, uh, this is all controls, this is all treatment. They actually separate pretty nicely. Um, and we did some um, function uh, um, enrichment on this. There are a lot of interesting metabolites in um, uh, which people don't know they play a role in the high carbon dioxide response. Um, uh, some, uh, some of them, for example, blastinosteroids, uh, flavonoids. Um, as you can see here, we have a glucosides. Uh, I have been working on glucosides for about 20 years. And recently, we also found a role of um, glucosinate degradation products in plant innate immunity. And uh, I want to draw your attention to this uh, alpha linolenic acid metabolism. Uh, you see, in 10 minutes, you see that getting enriched. Also, this 30 minutes, and also 60 minutes. So, I want to show you some um, um, metabolites uh, signif significantly changed at 10 minutes. Um, a lot of lipids, fatty acid, really interesting. Um, just morning acid, um, just morning acid, acylucin conjugate, which is an active form of uh, JA, and decreased, we have uh, steroids, um, uh, very interesting stuff, a lot of new uh, metabolites. So I just wanna show you one group, uh, which is the J. Uh, so, JA biosynthesis and signaling is pretty well studied. Uh, so, JA is made in a, a chloroplast or plastis, a precursor alpha linolenic acid, as I showed you. And JA is not, usually is not an active form. It need to be conjugated with acylucin to make a JA acylucin conjugate. And then it uh, interact with COI-1, which is a um, receptor and recruit the um, uh, transcriptional repressors, these jazz proteins for uh, degradation that release this MIG2, also called a gene one, so that it is, uh, initiate the JA um, gene expression. Um, so with arabidopsis, we have mutants um, like uh, the, uh, the jar mutants, uh, the gene two, MIG2 mutants, um, so to really test whether carbon dioxide function uh, through JA pathway, so we again use reverse genetics. As you can see, this is a, a JA pathway. You can see uh, the precursors, um, and when you have high, high carbon dioxide, so GA acylucin increase a lot. And um, here showing you use, using different mutants. So this is a Y type. If you treat it with high carbon dioxide, stomata will close, right? And then we have a COI-1, which is a receptor for the GA solution, so you don't have that response anymore, right? So jaw one is the, um, the uh, enzyme which makes the conjugate, um, GA solution conjugate. Um, so if you knock that out, this response is also compromised. So when you have a G1 knockout, um, it's, it's kind of a compromise a little bit, but not a lot at a late time point, because there are other MIPS, so they may be redundant. So this is a carbonic anhydrase, which is supposed to be the carbon dioxide uh, receptor. As you can see, if you uh, knock both, the one and four out, you don't have that closing re uh, response anymore. So through this functional validation and uh, through metabolomics, we actually discovered this GA 
play a big role in this carbon dioxide response. But how about low carbon dioxide? Um, would the cells just do the opposite thing? You know, now you, you, uh, when you have high carbon dioxide, you have higher GA, but in low carbon dioxide, would GA just go low, right? So, and the low carbon dioxide, zero ppm, again, this is ambient, and this is zero ppm, stomata will open really big, okay? So these are some representative images. So now we do, this targeted metabolomics, this metabolomics again, very interesting, is not what we expect. So the J pathways and no big changes. <coughs> Instead, we found a branching pathway. The traumatic acid, you can see these, these, are, the, these are 400 ppm control and this is a low carbon dioxide. Such a big increase, right? And, and you can see these are stomata. And we got the mutants again and we test so if you don't have these carbon dioxide receptors, you don't have the big opening anymore. And they cannot sense carbon dioxide. This is a field, there's no carbon dioxide there. Uh, so COI-1 and LOX-2 is a JA biosynthesis. Um, so you can see this process is all compromised, uh, not compromised, right? So that's, in, that's actually correlate with the JA, JA solution is not playing a big role in this case. Rather, the cells actually increase this side pathway and make traumatic acid. So this is a very interesting discovery. If we haven't done um, this metabolomics, we probably wouldn't really uh, find this. So just a quick summary. Um, elevated carbon dioxide can cause RS production, can cause redox changes, and we did a proteomics as well, um, but I, only showed you metabolomics. And using different platforms, we were able to quantify about 400 metabolizing gas cells. And uh, during high carbon dioxide treatment, we see 99 increased, 49 decreased. And at early time points, many of these fatty acids, you know, J metabolize increased. Then we use reverse genetics, and we actually did some functional characterization of this J pathway involvement in the high carbon dioxide response. Low carbon dioxide is not just a reverse of the uh, high carbon dioxide response, right? So right now what we are working on, remember I showed you ABA is also involved, right? In the pathogen cases. So when we do metabolomics and proteomics, we didn't put pathogen in the picture and now, in my lab where we're actually putting them all together and really study this disease triangle and how these different environment factors and affect the plant immunity. So a lot of people, a lot of students uh, have uh, uh, play a role in this process. I was about to say have been involved Right, which is not a good. <laughs> so Jennifer uh, essentially got the idea of doing one stone, two birds, right? Is that one stone, two birds, right? So Kelly uh, uh, essentially uh, worked on the LTP2, and Susan and Biswar, um, uh, they learned metabolomics uh, from Oliver. Um, so he has this workshop, 5,500 5, bucks, and it really worth the money. So he will pick you up and take you to a hotel. He will be your driver. Oliver is not here, so <laughs> attend his workshop. And Sheridan is following up on the, uh, on the disease triangle work. And actually, um, he's graduating this Friday, so I have to go back and uh, hold him. And he's a lab technician. This is my current lab. And um, I'm pretty lucky over the past years, um, most funding from NSF, and she gave me the math spec. Um, uh, Jennifer and USDA gave me a little bit of money. Um, but Jennifer's uh, fellowship, four years, all from USDA. And I want to thank my collaborator, longtime collaborator, Dr. Sally Asman uh, from Penn State. Um, I did a um, half a year sabbatical at the Lloyd Sumner Lab. I actually, Ron Rose on targeted metabolomics samples. I collaborate with uh, Hans Arben, uh, USDA on our campus, and I use uh, his GCMS. I have LCMS, but I don't have a GCMS. 
And uh, these are my thermal friends. Uh, so they, these help me out when um, I need um, some like Lumos capabilities. <laughs> or this uh, GC Orbi, you know, it's uh, really beautiful data. I want to spend the next uh, two or three minutes um, to show you um, what we can contribute. And recently, I got a, a triple quadruple. I have been using uh, AB uh, Q traps for many, many years. And recently, I got Artis. Uh, I show you this latest data and with um, um, Vanquish Horizon UHPRC. So six minutes, six minutes wrong. You got all the amino acid. It's uh, beautiful. And even loosen, isoleucine, no problem for us, right? Piece of a cake. So this is the more, okay? Another piece of a cake, all these hormones, right? Look at the ABA, JA. These are beautiful. IAA, JA, SA, OPDA, which is a precursor, right? JA isoleucine. This is, a, um, this is another acid. What is this? <laughs> Anybody know? I should know. <laughs> <laughs> Master jasmonic. Uh, Traumatic acid, I showed you increase so much on the low carbon dioxide, yeah? So, I mean, six minutes, not very long. Uh, so that's allow us to figure out this, right? So if you need help, uh, part of my job is to help the community. Um, I work uh, part-time at a core, and we have three PhD scientists. Um, we have pretty good instruments, um, so I'm happy to help. Another thing I want to let you guys know, and many of you already know, what's going on in Orlando in about a month and a half? Ubo, right? Right, right on Disneyland. So really beautiful, okay? So I hope to see you there, I will be there. And these are organizers, I don't see John yet, but uh, he's, he's around somewhere, he's gonna, oh, he's there. Yeah, he's one of the organizers and um, I was told, which is not good. So <laughs> Rob told me to do some advertisement. So John didn't ask me, but Rob asked me. Um, so Hubo is from uh, September, I think, um, September 30th to October the 3rd, right? So if you wanna go there early, there are some really good events for you. We have a Hubo Proteomics Informatic course in Orlando. Um, it's a five-day course, and you'll learn a lot of good stuff here. Very well prepared. And um, registration is only 200 bucks for five days, right? So it's not bad. Um, so I really look forward to see you guys there. Uh, thank you for your attention. I think uh, I probably have uh, spoken too fast. <laughs> Very nice. We have time for questions. Hi, P, for questions. So um, it's uh, pretty clear how the stomata are really relevant and, and how the signaling is affecting them. Do you think many of these same players, like LTP2, are important for the same type of function in other, you know, redox sort of? Um, absorption or whatever in other tissues, other plant tissues? Um, that's an excellent question. I actually don't know the answer. We only and found it in uh, gas cells. It's very abundant in gas cells. And are, is, are your samples also including palisade cells? and? No, okay. no. We only found it in the gas cells. And um, um, it's abundant protein and was annotated as a PR14. Um, is kind of an old protein. People know about this protein for more than 40 years. Uh, but uh, you know, the old protein with a new function in stomatal gas cells is really, really exciting. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, Xing, I have a yeah, very nice talk. So uh, I don't know whether you didn't mention it or you didn't do it. I know this TMT, uh, do you use antibody to enrich them after you do the labeling? I understand that most of other people, when they use them, especially with humans, so you have to isolate. Them. Otherwise, you look at the whole proteome, right? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Andy. Um, I actually forgot to mention, this is the beauty of TMT. They have an antibody. 
So you can enrich and pull out the cysteine peptides, just like uh, the ACAT. You know, you know, I think uh, Dr. Lee also mentioned ACAT. So you can really pull out the cysteine-containing peptides and uh, get enrichment. And guess what? It didn't work in our hands. <laughs> So we tried, it's obvious we want to get our cysteine peptides, we want to find out more kinases. That's what, our, that's what we are interested in. So we found this um, uh, OST1, uh, SNR 2.6, and MAP kinase 4 in our proteomics data. And we actually really interested in this PTM crosstalk. You know, how redox might, might affect kinase activity and protein phosphorylation. Uh, but two of my students tried, uh, Kelly and Jennifer both tried independently using the antibody. It didn't work. I don't know if anybody um, have used successfully. Um, I really want to learn. I don't know what's going on. We didn't get enrichment. All right, it's your chance to help him out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I need the help. Any other questions? Help me. <laughs> Thank you very much.